So hi everyone, I'm Aki Nakanishi, Ani Shunitsa Curator of Culture, Art and Education here at Poland Japanese Garden. Today I'm standing right outside our exhibition space, the pavilion, with the beautiful background of, of this absolutely amazing, immaculate garden right behind me. Today I'm just so excited to be able to uh, give you a quick virtual walkthrough of the freshly staged art exhibition. And the exhibition actually explores one of the most transformative periods in Japanese modern history. At the turn of the last century, so we are talking 100 to 130 years ago, not too distant, uh, you know, long ago, but we'll be vi visiting some of the quintessential pieces from that time frame. And, uh, you know, who better to walk through these absolutely amazing uh, pieces with the very collector, the very individual who's graciously lending all these pieces on display, Mr. Arwin Lavenberg. Thank Good you very much for making time you. available for us. Yeah, uh, yeah I've been through this uh, exhibition just a couple of uh, minutes ago and I, I'm kind of blown away by the, uh, of course, by the setting of the Japanese garden and by seeing these prints in this uh, incredible natural uh, but I guess tamed and curated setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that uh, you enjoy this brief walkthrough and uh, I hope that uh, you'll come and see the full exhibition uh, many times while it runs. So, walking into the first section of the exhibition, um, embellished with all these amazingly elaborate prints by Kunichika, would you be able to walk us through a little bit about who Kunichika was as an artist and sort of times that he lived through? Yeah, Kunichika started working uh, in the 1870s, uh, up until his death in 1900. And he came out of a hundred year old tradition of kabuki, rendering of kabuki actors and kabuki stage sets. And he did this, of course, within the framework of Ukeoe, which is, had a, at that time a 200-year-old uh, pedigree. He himself, while he's depicting actors who are the rock stars of the uh, period, is himself a bit of a star. And he spends his time at the theater backstage uh, He's friends with some of the major actors of the period. Uh, he drinks a little bit. Uh, he claims to have uh, moved his residence 80 to 100 times to what? have had many partners. Uh, and uh, while he's recognized as a master artist, and in fact one of the uh, last great ukeoi artists, uh, he's less interested in fame than living the life of, uh, living the high life, I guess we would, uh, we would say. Uh, though they're quite varied, but what you'll notice in all of these prints is a certain stylized way of handling, particularly faces, mm -hmm. elongated faces, that is part of the school uh, that he was trained in. He was trained by an artist called Utagawa Kunisara, uh, which is an artist's name rather than a real name. Uh, and uh, he uh, continued this tradition in the face of new technology. By the time of his death, we'll find that Ukeoe is almost gone. It's being seen as old hat by a younger generation who's looking for the realism, uh, supposed realism of photography uh, and the uh, modernity associated with color lithography mm. and uh, this 300 year old tradition of ukeoe the color print is uh, almost dead so um into the kind of second um you know section of the exhibition but we still see well this is actually the centerpiece representing kunichika right here being juxtaposed all by itself because it really does bring out the typical kind of quintessential Michika style, right? Yes, mm -hmm. and what we see here is pretty typical of the, uh, the way these prints were handled and mm -hmm. laid out. 
So you have your major characters in a particular scene from this play. Mm -hmm. You'll see these rectangular boxes. They're containing the names of the uh, actor, the role played. And if you look at the size, and you look at the size of these white rectangular boxes, which contain uh, Kunichika's name, mm -hmm. uh, you'll understand that his fame was really almost as great as these actors wow. that he's uh, that he's depicting. Uh, so that they were, you know, much like the playbills that you get when you go to a theater today. And we'll see as we look at the uh, Prince of Hasui mm -hmm. uh, that it was one man, a publisher, Watanabe Shozaburo, mm -hmm. who decided to revive the ukulele tradition, but in a way that would appeal to a Western audience that he had been building through selling some ukiyo-e originals, but also through doing ukiyo-e reproductions. Mm -hmm. Kawase Hasui was a polar opposite mm -hmm. of, uh, of Kunichika. Uh, he uh, knew he wanted to be an artist from a very young age. Uh, he was, uh, he's been described as someone who had a number of, of childhood illnesses that left him much weakened. And he was sent to live with a much beloved aunt in the uh, country. And during that period of recu recuperation and building his strength, uh, he uh, developed a, a deep affection for the natural landscape mm -hmm. of, uh, of Japan. Mm -hmm. These just caught on like wildfire uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the West because they were capturing an, uh, a Western idea of what people who perhaps had never been to Japan thought Japan should look like. <laughs> so, you know, we get into the whole idea of then an exoticized mm. uh, Japan. Uh, but he's injecting just this atmospheric uh, eye that, that just draws you into these, mm. into these scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is what attracted me initially to his, uh, to his work. I guess Hasui himself being from like built up area, um, central Tokyo almost, um, I guess helped him have the similar perspective um, um, of uh, Western tourists, I guess, of you know, being reminiscent of uh, the old Japan, if you like, uh, postcard scenery yes. from regional, um, provincial areas of Japan, I think, that he wasn't really um, Accustomed to, apart from the the time that he spent away from Tokyo, recuperating mm -hmm. his, from his illness, so he had that specific kind of feel for what would appeal to Western eye, if you like. And he was known to push the art. He knew he knew enough about carving that he knew what a carver could do, even if the carver didn't know. He knew what a printer. Can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, hence these uh, beautiful prints that could yeah. run 30, 40 impressions. All right. Uh, to get these, this great depth and feel of, of, of color. And of course, he's a master of, of light. Mm -hmm. He's a master of atmosphere. He's a master of snow. Mm -hmm. He's a master of, I don't know if we're getting in frame here, he's a master of the stylized way mm -hmm. of treating. Uh, treating rain. Mm -hmm. um, he's a master of emerging us into the scene that he's painting. This is certainly one of my favorite pieces actually. It just brings the best out of the Hasuism, if you like. The, the foreground, the reflection, the treatment of water surface, the kind of loneliness, uh, the poetic um, solitary feel, if you like, that's all created within that frame. I mean, is this also something that you like about Hasui? Because you seem to have uh, a variety of um, Hasui pieces kind of looking similar, so... Yeah, well, I, certainly one of the wonderful things about this piece and about other Has Hasui places, uh, pieces, if you've been to the place, if they still exist, and oh. this is Shinabasu An in... Uh, Wino Park in, in Tokyo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful if you can picture yourself, which, which I have, 
in this setting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then kind of move yourself back to the 1930s when this was created and what the city might have uh, might have looked like mm -hmm. uh, yeah it, it's just a, a, a fun thing to do and, and again when you look at the treatment of the water and these wonderful reflections yeah. which you know in, in a way are a bit abstracted mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly atmospheric, the handling of, of light and the reflections to mention, it's, it's masterful. There's going to be a whole bunch of uh, didactic texts all across the exhibition floor to give you a lot more insight and information about more context around these pieces provided beautifully by our exhibition consultant, Lin Katsumoto. She's done just a yeoman's work for all of us actually, digging into, diving into this scholastic sort of um, background to, you know, to give us more scholarly um, facts and background for each of these pieces across the exhibition. So you will definitely enjoy reading uh, those texts as well. So shall we uh, delve yep. into the last section? I am drawn to this particular piece here because I know this was your first acquisition as you started collecting. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, how this came about. When I first saw this print, it was at the gallery of uh, Frank Castle in San Francisco, and I had been drawn to his gallery after seeing what was really my first, certainly in, in the United States, major exhibition of mm. uh, landscape prints from the iconic artist Hiroshige and Hokusai. I went to Frank Castle's gallery, and with some trepidation, never having bought a piece of fine art before, Frank and his wife said, you might have interest in this artist is quite popular, Kawase Asui, and I was immediately drawn into this scene. I had gone to school in upstate New York. I had experienced uh, too much snow, uh, <laughs> and as I was uh, ending up, my undergraduate uh, days, I, I began to have these dreams of being out in the snow, uh, but in a way that I felt embraced by the, the landscape, though it was kind of forlorn. And that's, to this day, this is what this particular image does for me. It draws me in. Mm. Uh, it makes me feel alone but secure. Wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's lovely when a piece of art does that. To have these prints in this venue, it's absolutely a unique venue to come and be able to see the garden, see these prints, mm -hmm. walk out into the garden, come back, look at them again, mm -hmm. and really think mm -hmm. about the uh, relationship between this incredible garden and these incredible prints mm -hmm. and Japanese culture and the appeal that it has worldwide. Thank you for providing this venue. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it has been nothing but pleasure, sheer pleasure to work with you I and agree. to see this all coming together, getting ready for the, um, the big day that opens to the general public on this Saturday, November uh, 20th, run through January 30th next year. This exhibition for me really speaks volumes to, uh, as you said, the times we are literally going through the past couple of years. During lockdown, everyone kind of sought their own versions of uh, mental escape and mental journey. And in a lot of senses, I think these pieces provide you with uh, a very unique imaginary journey into, the, you know, some, somewhere else really. And then, take it all in outside the garden, and then, like you said, come back into the exhibition to have the kind of combination of really, real um, garden experience and the exhibition experience here, your imaginary journey, will be a beautiful gift for, for yourself, for your guests, and for your family and friends. So we very much look forward to seeing you at the exhibition when it opens. And please do read also the fuller kind of background information about the collector himself, the exhibition, and of course the artists themselves, all up on Poland Japanese Garden website. So with that, thank you so much, uh, Wayne, for spending time with us, walking, walking us through um, this freshly put together exhibition, and we very much look forward to you, to welcoming all of you here at Poland Japanese Garden. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.